Yeah, it's the idea of a, par, a virtual power plant, right? We not only observe what uh, what there is, uh, what uh, what is there, but we also can act and we can steer the units in order to help uh, the system keep the balance. Virtual power plants are an essential part of the energy transition. They combine the growing number of decentralized PV and wind power plants, but also increasingly consumers and battery storage. However, most people are probably not even aware of the sheer scale of these plants. For example, one of the largest virtual power plants operated in Europe, Nextkraftwerke, just reached the amount of 10,000 megawatt of aggregated power this year, which is as much as seven average nuclear power plants. So what role do virtual power plants operator play in the electricity market? What functions do the plants themselves perform? And how will they influence the energy transition today and in the future? Let's find out in this episode. Welcome to the Smartery Podcast, a podcast for and with the creators of the new energy world. A world in which energy will be renewable, decentralized and digital, bringing together electricity, heat and mobility. Let us show you how we will get there and who will get us there. Since I mentioned that Nextkraftwerke is one of the largest operators in this field, we thought, why not talk to them directly? So I'm very happy to welcome Alexandra Radvanska, who is the International Business Development Manager at Nextkraftwerke and has a long history of working in the industry as, for example, for Inno Energy or General Electric, along with her colleague Leonard Hirsch, who is the team lead in the business unit, Virtual Power Plant Solution and Services at Nextkraftwerke. Well, great to have you both on the podcast, Alexandra and Leonard. Welcome. Hi, it's like nice to meet you here. Hello, happy to be here. Well, I mean, we all know in Europe and specifically in Germany, uh, we have quite some intense turbulences on the energy market. Um, all businesses are quite worried um, heading into winter. I would assume it also keeps you on your toes in your job. So on the power exchange as such, um, where Nextkraftwerke also sells its aggregated electricity, Prices are up and down and on a roller coaster. So how does that affect your work? Yeah, um, maybe I can answer to that. Um, so for sure, it affects our work a lot at the moment. We are um, from in our day to day business. We are um, facing this situation because what we actually do is we aggregate many different clients in our visual power plants. So um, we have this is our core business, so to say, right? Um, we aggregate producer side, mainly PV, wind and biomass plants and NA them a market entry so what we do here is um, we integrate them in a system in our system collect the data um, they, they they have their live in feed data so to say we create forecasts to expect what what are going uh, what are they going to produce the next day and that we have to market at the at the energy exchanges and we have also to adjust the product the production of these plants if something unexpected happens so we do face the situation at the moment um, as we are daily marketing these energy sources um, and uh, as you might imagine as prices are very high at the moment on a, on the ground level also our risk increase in marketing we have to be really make sure to to uh, forecast the right production um don't uh, to reduce our imbalance as much as, as much as possible so we have to be very very careful at the moment so uh, do virtual power plants actually also have an influence on the exchange prices or are you on the receiving end of the price yeah definitely i would say so because what we do is we enable comparably small renewable energy units right and we integrate them into the market um we as as next Kraftwerke are mostly on the supply side as we are um our, our portfolio consists mostly of pv uh, biogas and wind and hydro and so on but also on the demand side with uh, so, some demand units we aggregate in our system and you might imagine the more units coming into a system it has also an effect, right? We reposition um, on, on both sides here. And here it's very important to see, I would say, that um, the more renewables you generally would add into a, such a system, especially with prices at the moment, it would lead to decreasing pi prices. This is about the general price level, maybe. When you talk about um, situations of scarcity, for example, we can also deliver flexibility with our units. So we can be there when there is probably a lack of energy with our biomass plants, with hydro plants, with batteries, stuff like that. So yeah, we we try to um, to be as, as good as possible in the market. And in the best case, we our part in the market is also to smooth prices. So I, I would say we have a smoothing price effect with, our, with bringing our assets to the market. 
So that refers to price fluctuations and turbulences. If we skip over to the more technical bit of it and um, the, the power fluctuation, especially with renewables, do virtual power plants also play a role in helping to stabilize the power grids on a technical level? And if so, how does it work, Alexandra? Yeah, that's um, the general idea or the main goal of a virtual power plant, uh, right? So uh, the idea of a virtual power plant here in Europe, uh, in our company in Germany, was created in order to counteract to the instability that is uh, that is brought by weather dependent uh, resources such as photovoltaics and wind. And these uh, technologies, the share of these technologies of wind and, and solar units is constantly growing right here in Europe. This is a known fact. So it influences the electricity generation in the whole national system or even the European system, right? It becomes more volatile. So on one hand, uh, you can see that we have the um, the generation, which is not very stable. It's weather dependent. It's not always very controllable, especially if you just consider one solar park or one wind park uh, alone, right? And on the other side, you have the demand, which is still not so flexible as you would wish for, right? And then we do not have, uh, again, efficient, uh, efficient and sufficient energy storage capacity that could be uh, used in the moments when the supply and the demand uh, for electricity do not meet, right? And uh, in this situation, you also have parties with great responsibilities such as DSO and TSO that really must make sure that the electricity demand and supply perfectly matches in every second. Sounds like a tricky situation to solve. So um, how do you come into the play? So we are there, we as a virtual power plant, as an energy trader, as a, b a balancing a uh, uh, service provider, we are there to help the transmission system operators to uh, keep the balance uh, in the system. And uh, well, how do we do that? First of all, we forecast the expected generation in the weather dependent sources, such as photovoltaics and wind. We also forecast the expected electricity generation in, in other parts of our portfolio, such as hydropower plants, uh, biogas power plants, uh, and everything that delivers electricity, right? Then our role is to inform the TSOs what we are going to have, what we are expecting, what will we bring to the market. We deliver them the forecast and we also trade this electricity on the, on the short term uh, market on a day ahead basis, which also already provides an, a piece of information to the, um, to the managers of the electrical system what to expect on the next day, right? We at Nextraveca, we specialize in short term power markets. So we trade the electricity mainly on the day ahead market and in the intraday markets, trying in fact to match the forecast uh, or what we are going to have in our portfolio on the day of the delivery. And then when the uh, when the day of the delivery comes, we always try to match the gaps between what we what we have sold and what uh, we are actually going to deliver in order to um, avoid the imbalance in our portfolio and also to minimize the need for costly interventions by the TSOs. Um, so that's what we call proactive flexibility uh, from a trader. There is also one case of uh, proactive flexibility, which is in fact uh, doable with steerable assets uh, that we have in the portfolio, uh, biogas power plants, hydro power plants mainly. This is an activity uh, which we do when we observe uh, changes or differences in the prices throughout the day. So for example, in the weekends or uh, in summer during the photovoltaic hours, the energy prices are low, very low or even negative. And this informs us about the fact that there is enough electricity to cover the demand right, of, uh, of the consumers. So there is in fact no need from the traders, from the aggregators, from virtual power plants to mobilize additional uh, energy sources. So we can either take out the energy from the market, for example, by ramping down uh, the production in steerable assets, such as biogas power plants, for example. And I guess it also works uh, the other way around. If you need to ramp up power supply because there's a bigger demand for power or energy, 
I see. That's how we create flexibility. And there is one more way how you provide electricity uh, to the uh, flexibility to the system, which is uh, to respond to the uh, transmission system operator's needs, right? So we are also a um, provider of frequency containment reserve and frequency restoration reserve. And it means that when the transmission system operator calls us to do that, then we ramp up or uh, ramp down the production of the uh, electricity in our portfolio to uh, really help them keep the frequency at the 50, 50 hertz. In the last years, we have been doing it with normal assets like biogas and hydropower plants. But recently, we also gained the experience with electrolyzers, uh, with uh, batteries, uh, and uh, even with uh, electric vehicles and residential batteries. All right, Alexandra, that ate up basically the portion I assigned for you um, throughout the podcast. I'm afraid the rest <laughs> goes to Leonard. <laughs> um, but thanks a lot. I, I think that basically gave us the, the one one of how a VPP operates. Um, I really want it to be very informative in it. <laughs> Thanks. You, you clearly come well prepared. But uh, just as a very small follow-up question. Um, so that means not only do you aggregate, but you are in close lockstep with the actual energy producers and you do have the leverage to actually ramp down like a biogas factory. Yeah, it's the idea of a, power, a virtual power plant, right? We not only observe what uh, what there is, uh, what uh, what is there, but we also can act and we can steer the units in order to help uh, the system keep the balance. Oh, so interesting! I would have so many questions how that works on a technical level, but I think that would be an episode in itself, so we'll skip that. Now we have biogas, um, you know, um, units. We have all sorts of different units. Those are probably still very large and more on a professional. level level. Now we have more and more consumers, I guess, being integrated actively into the energy system. Uh, the more also home storage grows, the more intelligent units are at home in people's homes. So uh, what's their role in ensuring like a reliable power supply and grid stability? I guess the professional word here is demand side flexibility. Do you also, can you steer that as well? Or is that more an effect that changes the structure of how you operate as a virtual power plant? Um, I, I would say this is part wise to answer, right? So in general, there are already demand side flexibilities also integrated in our virtual, virtual power plant, for example. But nowadays, it's really mainly bigger industry processes. Um, aluminium is like a big topic here, I would say. But what we could actually observe in the past was that the flexibilization of the system was really more happening on the supply side until now, now speaking for Europe and Germany in, um, in specific, I would say. Um, this is simply based on the fact, I would say, that, that they are naturally already in the energy system and they try to, to leverage their opportunities or, or try to leverage their opportunities in the past. Now, as prices are roller coasting, um, as you as you mentioned before, right, the demand side has is facing energy as a major factor of their processes. So they try to already also enter the market. Um, flexibilization of energy is a big topic for them, and I think we will see increasing um, participation here in the future. I said partwise at the beginning, I would say, because um, we are mainly our expertise in in how to flexibilize processes is now nowadays more or less really focused on the um, supply side or in general in the energy is very focused on the supply side. So I think for us as a VPP, it's very important to analyze the processes, understand the processes to the fullest because the clients will only hand over the flexibility to you if they really trust you that you do not disturb their their primary goal, which is not energy optimization, but some industry process. So actually, I introduced the question where you can see that I'm not an expert in the field yet because... Um, I imagined private consumers, but you refer to industrial consumers. And I absolutely can understand that if you run an aluminium <laughs> factory, that you certainly do, yeah, you, you need a high level of trust that your <laughs> your production doesn't suddenly stop because um, Leonard at um, Next Kraftwerke decides to shut down the electricity supply. Um, so th that I understand totally. Now to my um, naively informed question, does private consumption also play a role in the long run? 
Uh, I guess on the long run, definitely. So, so how you could see the flexibilization of su such a thing as the demand side is it's really it's it's the big steps or the, the small steps first, right? So first you, it will be the bigger processes, and then the more and more, um, like also the um, the expertise and the different technologies in the field also get more profitable in terms of um, digitalization prices, technology you use to um, leverage all all these potential revenues um, will the, the asset size will smaller and smaller that's what I try to get to, uh, to say here right and we can definitely see in, in the market we can already see that there are ma many upcoming companies that also try to focus on that right but if you want to come up with an example here when you the, the revenue you can get out of optimizing your washing ma machine is probably something in from you get from 50 euros per year to 40 euros if you really do a good job right if um, and And, and there you have to be very cost efficient to, to go to, to this use case at all. So we, we do not see that at the moment happening. But I think in the future, this will definitely be, yeah, be a use case. But on the, let's say, in this transition period, you would rather expect, uh, for example, residential batteries or electric vehicles or maybe heat pumps uh, to enter such a market, right? Because these are the devices that really are more uh, energy consuming uh, and it really makes already more or less economic sense to, to play with their uh, consumption or to do something with them that benefits the, the grid. Absolutely correct. So the washing machine, I guess, will be the last part that we will see flexibilized, flexibilized at the end. Now, a topic that is super fascinating, specifically because the potential for acting as a huge virtual buffer is enormous. But however, every time we talk about it also at, for example, at um, the Smart E in Munich in every panel, you always hear that vehicle to grid is so fascinating, potentially so powerful, yet we're totally lacking behind. And usually it's because there's not a viable business uh, model for it yet. I know that Next Kraftwerke also works with Hyundai or LG um, Electronics on a project in that realm to see how much, you know, the e-vehicles could provide balancing power um, for the transmission. So... Are you more operating on a, uh, to, to, you know, to have a pilot project on a technical level or are you also a step ahead already in terms of actually creating a, vi a viable or feasible business case? Mm -hmm. So what we have done in this project, we have already mm, entered the market. So we have already pre-qualified uh, the assets, which is um, an essential and in fact crucial step to even enter the market for balancing uh, energy. So what we do in this uh, project, we partially as well optimize the moment when the um, electric vehicles are charging, right? So when they're consuming electricity. But in fact, a more important goal in this project was to prove that electric vehicles can deliver a secondary control reserve. So uh, what I mentioned as a, a before as a reactive flexibility, this kind of flexibility that is being turned on on a signal from the transmission system operator when the transmission system operator sees that the uh, frequency in the grid uh, goes uh, either higher or lower from the 50, uh, 50 hertz. So what has happened in this uh, project, which uh, was in fact the first one in Germany, we have certified, so to say, the cars uh, of Hyundai. And we have delivered uh, to the TSO area of uh, Amprion the uh, frequency restoration reserve. It means practically that Amprion as a TSO sends a signal to a market player, market uh, participant next Kraftwerke, to request the virtual power plant to deliver the frequency, uh, fre uh, frequency service. For example, to ramp up the production or decrease the consumption. And uh, next Kraftwerke has, uh, has the virtual power plant and chooses from different assets, one of them being electric vehicles, to, for example, ramp up the charging, right? To start the discharging to the, back to the grid or to lower their consumption of electricity in the charging activity. And we have proven together with our partners in this project that 
it is a viable solution. It technically works and it really can bring a benefit to the owner of the electric vehicle. Maybe it will not uh, pay off the whole car in one year, but definitely it will lower the total cost of ownership in the long run. Now, I have to come up with a follow up question here. Um, on the one hand, just technically, how many cars do you need for that to be interesting? Are we talking about five cars, 500 cars, 5,000 cars? And how long do you need access to them? Is it like a question always of like five seconds because that's a, a moment? Or does it mean you change the charging um, process over the course of half an hour, an hour? Like what are we usually talking about there? So yeah, maybe I can uh, jump in here. So um, this is definitely as it's very small scale, right? In comparison to all the other technologies we use. In the, so with the AFR, so we are talking about really in megawatt size. If you go by cars, you probably need to make this like a really sufficient work in product you need you have to scale up to the area of thousand definitely I, I would say so right um, in terms of service provision it's 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 not um, it's it's really short notice so to say also the, the, the service of AFR is the signal is close to immediately by the um, system operator so you need something like a reserve time period which could be like a charging period where you just say that when the car is charging in a certain time slot for for some hours you could participate in that service because Because you have to nominate up front. This has to be clear here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, coming back to what you said last, Alexandra, that it might be a business model where actually the car owner could participate. How close are we to that really? On the one hand, I assume, you know, as the system operator, you have an eye on that chunk and making the profit. So uh, how willing are operators to actually uh, give off a cut to the private car owner? And because that's always when you, when you come to panels at the Smart TE, that's where people are like, they haven't really figured out a business model that actually works. Potentially, yes practically no so could you just in two sentences quickly describe how you would envision that business model who pays who how much for example mm. so um, very very short answer for every activation for every action of delivering the reserve to the uh, to the system we get paid and uh, we as an aggregator we have such a business model that we share this uh, this win uh, with uh, the end customer maybe we can have this luxury because we have already a good basis of the of the uh, consumers right of the customers right so we have really thousands of assets who participate in this uh, in this program and we are very nicely covering our fixed costs maybe if someone would uh, work only with uh, 20 cars let's say let's say uh, just throw such a number then uh, the revenue wouldn't cover their costs and then they would have to find out a different business model we have a luxury to stay in such a in such a business that we really put the gain uh, to the consumer mm. so it's a numbers game the more cars you have in the system the more viable the business becomes it's unfortunately the scale effect but also we have to add here actually that we are working with Hyundai and LG and stuff to be, because they're doing kind of a sub aggregation and we are so to say delivering the service for them the redistribution under this umbrella is uh, uh, so they, you are totally right i think there's not really a perfect business case of how the how this all gets distributed at the end we have this partner who's doing the sub aggregation for us we are corresponding with them so to say and they are then yeah they are somehow managing how this is distributed to the cars all right so we talked about cars now but of course people specifically this winter are investing heavily in, in new solar systems on the roof in heat pumps uh, mainly in heat pumps basically that's i think the biggest thing for this and next winter to save costs so with all these devices uh, will we Will we be part of a virtual power plant eventually? Yeah, this is this refers actually to the point we discussed earlier a little bit. I think not yet, right? So because the, the fixed costs we will not cover to enter your home system. This is, doesn't make sense at the moment. But what is totally clear is that the electrification will increase and we will definitely have a need for um, have a smart electrification, so to say, right? It's not just um, buying uh, electric heating or something and plugging it in and, and then uh, I don't know what happens next so to say so i think the level of how small we get in aggregated units will decrease 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 because also te technology is evolving right and i wouldn't see the so as with the washing machine this is probably the, the last thing in the chain right that we will access um, but the idea in general is absolutely uh, so it could absolutely happen i guess in the future 
how many years are we talking about? Because I'm sorry, I just have to ask you, because if you go to big trade shows, you know, they all envision that smart grid. And um, there's a lot of startups who, for example, you know, have their smart boilers integrated into the system, etc. I know it all sounds like technically it's just around the corner. But you say, like, hold on, we go from bigger sized units to smaller sized units uh, over a course of 10 years? I think it will be earlier. And especially that there is no the virtual power plant. There are many virtual power plants. Very, uh, many companies are aggregating different uh, uh, distributed energy resources, being it uh, photovoltaic units, biogas power plants, and also heat pumps. This is uh, already starting. This is true. And I think that we will all I really think that if we all have an um, electric device that uh, consumes a lot of electricity and has quite a bigger uh, capacity than a washing machine, for example, sorry for the washing machine producers, that will all become a part of virtual power plants. Uh, at least this is my hope, because if we electrify everything, we electrify transport, heat and everything that there is, then uh, there really must be several informed parties who take part and who really manage uh, this uh, energy demand in uh, in an intelligent way because otherwise the transmission system operators will have way too much uh, work to do and way too much headache. So you're optimistic that we get there a lot sooner. Um, so um, I, I hope you're right, Alexandra. Uh, that would be very nice. Where might it happen first? Are there areas, regions in Europe um, or worldwide where um, virtual power plants are specifically advanced or more spread? Mm, depending in what advanced. So here in Western Europe, we have very nice uh, virtual power plants that are advanced in forecasting renewables, steering renewables, delivering uh, frequency uh, services from distributed resources. And for example, in other parts like um, Australia, uh, USA, you have virtual power plants that focus on a different goal. They focus on managing and consumers in their houses to, uh, in managing residential batteries and small thermostats. So they are also advanced, but they are advanced in engaging and consumers in their houses. And we are more advanced here in Europe in managing the huge fleet of uh, weather dependent energy generation that we have built over, over the last years. So I think there is a specialization and this specialization is really histor history driven. Uh, so I think that currently we have systems that are diverging. They are very grow, um, evolving to be very different from each other. Maybe in the future with more technology transfer, with more uh, exchange between the, the countries, they, they will become uh, more, uh, more unified. But I think that there is no one winner in the world or one winning market in the world. What's really interesting is that you said other regions are more ahead in integrating consumers. So that puts um, out the option of just like us catching up with other regions. So that means that um, it's not a question of technical or regulation, regulatory feasibility. It's just a question of maybe visiting those regions and taking the knowledge to us here in Europe. You mentioned that, you know, weather forecasts are very important, specifically here in Europe when it comes to power production. How important is the forecast issue in regards of consumption or available storage capacities is that even a field that's easier to predict than the weather? Yeah, probably yes, I would say. So you have to here you also have to see the history, I would say, right? With weather forecasts, we are really good in advance because we got many, many PV in Germany and and a lot of wind power plants in Germany. So there was a really big need in Europe in the first place, I would to say, to have a really good and efficient forecast for these kinds of technologies because you have to handle them. If you do not do it, you have a real problem in the grid. Um, so it's always a little bit incentive driven, I would say right it's the same with why the consuming side is what alexandra just told for example in other countries um they're facing of potential blackouts or, or not having electricity for a time so that the consumers really also uh, try to try really to 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 um to enter the market there right for us now as i stated already i would say if you go con consumption side here you have to distinguish between consumption side and storage capacities what you mentioned for the consumption side we will see that definitely um i think now as there there's really a need for the consumption to lower the energy costs so there will be a bigger need for really leveraging their processes also according to energy prices and then the one comes with the other you know if you 
you have that need, you will also focus on, on getting better in forecasts. And with storage capacities, um, this is really good to calculate, actually, if you're talking, for example, about batteries right here and doing not so much of forecasting, but a calculation. Um, if, if, if you say, I want to act tomorrow with this schedule, so to say, right, I want to operate my battery like this, you can pretty, pretty good calculate how your storage will look like. So, and this is already happening, actually, right? With batteries, for example, um, I, I know, I think you, you were questioning about batteries with storage capacities. Um, that w when you take part in short-term markets or um, also in ancillary service, you really have to manage your, your storage and therefore the forecasting is already pretty much advanced, I would say. Last question, where are we headed in the market with VPPs as such? Now, Nextcraftwerk is a huge operator. Are we looking into a scenario where we have maybe five operators dominating the seen as for example as you have like with um, you know grid operators etc or are we more moving into a scenario where it's going to be a huge ecosystem with small big and all sorts of vpp players I think this is uh, this is a tricky one because um, as as we already tried to say, it's a, the, the definition of the term VPP is not very clear, right? If you look in the uh, playing field we are in at the moment, I would say there are there were more players and there are some players yet now um, that are doing the business we are doing, um, but there are whole other um, yeah market areas where the people or the companies also um, operate VPPs and these are can be understood could be understood as VPPs piece right um let's say a whole household consumption heat pumps so on so on so there will be different playing fields so to say um where you will have strong strong competition and probably not like a huge number of different players but there will be different playing fields <laughs> wonderful wow well, thanks uh thanks a lot to the both of you it's really been a pleasure i think i've somewhat turned into a vpp specialist in just under 35 minutes um from a, from what i got for you super fascinating to see really um how closely knit together um you have the whole the whole value chain from energy production over distribution transmission to the whole um steering that the vpp um operator does to then the demand side so very interesting to see um how that already all is integrated as we speak and how important it is to have these aggregators in the long run so let's hope by the way that really the v2g case you're working on uh, will come to fruition very quickly because i think it's one of the biggest assets we need um, on the long run for a distributed renewable power system so thanks a lot to the both of you really for taking your time today thanks for having us thank you More detailed information on virtual power plants can be found at EM Power Europe, the international exhibition for energy management and integrated energy solutions. Information about the exhibition, the conference or the latest news from the industry can be found online at em-power.eu.